Um, our next speaker is Punar Karakulchuk. Uh, Punar Karakulchuk received um, her graduate degree in Ottoman Turkish language uh, from Marmara University. And she's continued uh, onto a PhD in linguistics and Armenian language in Sorbonne, more precisely at INALCO, the National Institute of Oriental Languages and Civilizations, um, where she's still pursuing a PhD in linguistics. Her research is on the interaction of Armenian Turkish languages within the scope of Turkish texts with Armenian letters, and she's also focusing on sociolinguistics. Her paper today is entitled The Country of the Enemy and the Language of Grandmothers. So I give the floor to Merhaba Pare, Fazla Since we don't have time, I will continue reading in this presentation. We will look at the Lebanon Armenians Turkish memory and also the Bushamut Armenian city and I'll talk about Turkophonia there. And this was done to register Turkish oral data. And this is part of my doctoral thesis where I worked on the linguistic interaction. Although we've accepted the existence of uh, Armenian letter Turkish literature, We're quite surprised when we see American Armenians speaking archaic Turkish from the 19th century. The last example of that is, for example, a French Armenian at an airport was questioned why and how he speaks Turkish, and then he was labeled as a secret agent and he was banned from entering Turkey. Linguistics and social linguistics are not. Uh, quite understood, but a linguistic research, I'm actually, I've talked long about how I could speak on it without being an academician myself uh, for, from the Citizen Speak Turkish threshold to how do you speak Turkish? Are you a secret agent? When did we transition to this? Or for Armenian uh, in Turkey, where there's, when they say Armenia, Armenian, they consider Eastern Armenians. How can we understand that correlation? Again, uh, the peoples of Turkey, after they visit Armenia, with the discovery of how strong cultural ties we have, th this is often in the newspapers. Now, if we arrive at Borsham from there, we see a cultural scene where we express ourselves in similar ways in Anatolian cities. I told my uh, Turkish and Armenian friends where I had to uh, do a small research in Borshamut. The reactions were saying, good luck, uh, be careful because Borshamut Armenians are not like other Armenians of the world. The first day in the field I said, yes, they're right, because Borshamut is a lot like Adana Kilis, Urfa, Antep, Marash, but especially, uh, particularly Adana, where we like to express ourselves on the street by cursing. I calmed down. And uh, I thought I was almost at home in Adana, and the Armenians speak Anatolian Turkish and Armenian community language, also written and oral Arabic, English, and French. Uh, we're in Lebanon where people are bilingual, trilingual from birth. And we see that we understand Lebanese Arabic almost like a Turkish dialect. And you think that people will understand your Turkish if you speak with a certain accent. Because none of these languages are spoken in the sterile manner that is imposed in modern Turkey. And according to prominent sources, this uh, reaches back to when Kilikian Ar Armenians were Turkophones. And Armenian or va variants of uh, Armenian. So there's a bilinguality, for example, Kilish, Maras, Urfa, Zeytun, and Antep. Each of these cities 
besides Turkish, spoke Armenian or Parpar. During and after the genocide, uh, Kilikian Armenians were exiled into Syria. Some of those that could arrive in Syria then later on settled in Lebanon. With Beirut as a center, uh, they were all together in places called camps and over time they've reconstructed their entire lives. And two of these cities are still existing in Burshamut, you can go and see them. After a life in wooden shelters that burned down a few times, they started buying the lands they were on and they built their schools and churches, but land was very expensive, so there are no gardens in Borshamut today. The Borshamut Armenians in 1945 and 1946, upon call by the uh, Soviet Armenia, Republic of Armenia, sold what little land they had and moved to Armenia, or couldn't. They sold their house and houses and remained in Borshamut. In the Near East, Borshamut is the most densely populated city and following the civil war, as opposed to Beirut, which turned into a ghost town, is a very vibrant center of trade and commerce. Uh, Borshamut, where life is on the streets rather than in the homes, is uh, there's always a surprise around the corner in this city. And it reminds you of the stories of the, uh, the street Armenians, for example, when they would uh, close up shop in the evening, a merchant turns into a uh, or possibly yoga instructor could teach you for hours. So. Don't think a vendor is just a vendor while you're walking the streets. And I listen to these stories uh, on the streets with Anatolian Turkish, because when you ask someone if they do or don't speak Turkish, they look at you silently uh, for a few minutes because you understand that to them the question is like asking a Frenchman if, you, if he speaks French. And again, the answer is a question, where are you from? You don't speak our Armenian, and you speak the language of Armenia. And when I speak Armenian in Armenia, I was assumed uh, Syrian. But I speak Western Armenian, your Armenian. Where do you think I am when I said that? Uh, a gentleman of Tarsus from Bursamut said, uh, listed many cities from the Middle East to the US except for Turkey. And I said, there's a, another country very nearby, but there was no response when I say Turkey. We don't think nothing of that uh, place, and we look at our business. And when I ask, do you speak Turkish? The response I get in a dialect is that we speak Turkish better than Turks. So when we consciously talk about Turkish and speaking Turkish, I'm stuck. The 100 years of long and nomadic story is a little bit annoyed but also smiling but also so poignant that it makes you cry while you laugh so that is the memory that Turkish has because Turkish is from a time where they lived in a houses of one or two rooms and from uh, passing on stories to next generations in Turkish but it was also the language of barefoot uh, grandmothers who marched all the way there and survived also it was the language of the cities and st city streets and rooms and other than churches where they prayed, uh, it was the language of prayer chambers. It was the language of letters sent to relatives that moved to Armenia or other countries in Armenian letters. In the field, the data that covers the Kilikin cities, the grandparents mostly spoke Turkish. If one of the parents or both of the parents spoke Armenian or Parpar, then they would have to switch to Turkish. So speaking Parpar on the streets is almost at all times a reason to be ridiculed. So the street language turned to Turkish as well. With the construction of schools, the new generation started learning Armenian and Arabic, and thus families started to learn Armenian from their children. 
you know, I could share a story of a grandfather. The grandfather returns home happy with his day, and he says, I learned Armenian today. And when they ask him what they learned, he says, Sikhtur, garlic. So first the Parpars disappeared, and with the loss of the grandparents, Turkish was slowly abandoned, but Turkish was never forgotten. While sp talking about speaking Turkish consciously, that's what I wanted to say. When you meet a Turkophone at another corner of the world, you remember your knowledge of Turkish. And when I told them that I was from Turkey in Istanbul, they said, well, you're Turkish. And they wouldn't speak Armenian. No, I say, I'm Turkish and I study Armenian and say, And they said that I spoke a strange Armenian, not the Makur Borshamut Armenian. Uh, when I listened for a while, in order to speak uh, their Armenian, my sterile academic Armenian, I had to add some small things from their Turkish I understood. So I comprehended the system quickly, and within a few days, I started speaking Burshamut Armenian. There are examples here, I won't be able to explain all of them now. But as a Kilikian, I was speaking with a disturbing Aratian accent. And I say, you have a garbage Arat because there's a mountain of garbage on the other end. Uh, last example from the dialogues. The question of Tunuma Muhtas Turkes, I am a Mahtan Turkan. Again, I learned to say that from Armenian, but again, there were some things that were missing, and that's where my linguistic colleague came in and said, You don't know how to respond. Masmakur Turkem is what you're supposed to say. Then they will understand. He said, Now, Masmakur, for those that don't know, it's not just in Turkish or Armenian, but it's in uh, the literature. It's a structure that is used to uh, repeat the first syllable of a word to emphasize it, and you can do it in many languages. So I was a dubious Turk who couldn't speak any of the languages in the end, but I wasn't alone because these essentialist interventions of the society which ignore and oppress linguistic elements I want to say that they try to preserve themselves. The Morshamut Turkish has other functions historically because it was the language of uh, conversing within the family uh, without letting the children know. But children spoke Turkish faster, learned Turkish faster because it was a language also to curse because Armenian was a holy language we didn't have, which didn't have those bad words. and. With Turkish, those curse words sounded sweeter. It was the language of songs because Armenian songs were always poignant. And for international media, it's the chosen language for TV. And we also see the effects of Arabian cultural language. I can emphasize that it's something that has to be learned because the grandparents didn't speak Arabic. On the contrary, the Arabs who learned Armenian to work with Armenian to this, actually back in the day learned Anatolian Turkish from them. At the final, uh, in the final two generations, Turkish has been replaced with Arabic. And on the other hand, by the Tashnak, Turkish is considered a hostile element. And with the purpose of strengthening Armenian in the next generations, Turkish has been become a language that is banned in the streets. So there were posters on the shops saying, to those who speak Turkish, respond in Armenian. And for the exact opposite of that, I can give an example as well. Uh, a grandmother who spoke Turkish to me and delightfully sang to me in Turkish, I spoke Armenian to it, but I said, why do you speak Turkish to me while I'm speaking Turkish to you? You could go speak your Armenian with the other Armenians, is what she said. So what I want to say is, Turkish for the Turkish was left in the uh, 
homelands of the exiled Bosham Armenians, those Armenians in exile inherited their oral history with Turkish in the, their nearly constructed life. Turkish has become a part of their identity. And then amongst the languages that they later learned, Turkish was never at the status of a foreign language. Also, they were objecting to the ban on Turkish. And I could say in general, what they say is, we, we speak all types of languages, but not speak Turkish. One language is one person. If Turkish is forbidden, will the grandmothers not speak? That's what they know, that's what they speak. There is no ban. These are uh, things of the past. Before I conclude my remarks, I'd like to emphasize some questions. In Kilikian cities, the hegemony of Turkish is a separate issue. The fact that Turkish is such a dominant language and As we can see in uh, Turkish literature and Armenian letters, it's not subjected to a multi-dimensional banning. And also the the fact that Burshamut Armenian, uh, should it be considered a diaspora language? I'm following that the Burshamut Turkish, where does it lie in the history of Turkish, for example, should be considered as a diasporic Turkish? In conclusion, Burshamut is potentially a rare city for a link between Armenians and Turks. The Western Armenian is quite strong and resistant in Burshamut. And today in Burshamut, the language is not Western Armenian almost, but the uh, Turkish of the grandparents, because speaking Turkish is a it manifests itself as a way of resistance towards the violent history. And this is where I would conclude my remarks. And all the dialogues that I've exemplified here actually point to a phenomena. And I have the written version, which uh, where I can better try to explain in detail. And I do apologize. And I send my salutes to uh, Boshamut, Armenians and Turks through you. And that was a censored merci.